And I call the member for Fraser. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak today on the Appropriation Bill No. 3, 2013-14, Appropriation Bill 2004, 2013-14, and Appropriation Parliamentary Department Bill No. 2, 2013-14. In these bills, the government is requesting that Parliament approve additional expenditure of around $14.8 billion which largely reflects the government's decisions outlined in the 2013-14 mid-year economic and fiscal outlook. Let me say from the outset that the opposition don't oppose the passage of the three appropriations bills we're debating in the parliament today. Uh, but without denying this bill being read a second time, I move that all the words after that be omitted with a view to substituting the following words. While it's not declining to give the bill a second reading, the House notes that, one, the government repeatedly stated before the election that if debt is the problem, more debt is not the answer. Two, the 2013-14 mid-year economic and fiscal outlook showed a $17 billion budget blowout in the 2013-14 budget deficit, which at the time represented a $167 million budget blowout per day since the government took office. Three, the 60 per cent of the predicted budget blowout in 2013-14 was due to the decisions of the government alone. Four, the government has sought to pave the way for deep cuts to the federal budget by deliberately blowing out the budget and establishing its commission of audit. And five, these cuts would be another example of this government saying one thing before the election and doing the complete opposite after it. Deputy Speaker, what we've continually seen from this government is that they do one thing after the election, having said the complete opposite before the election. We have a litany of examples, the renewable energy target, jobs, taxation, cuts to health and education, and in this particular case, the budget. We've had a lot of slogans from the uh, uh, coalition prior to the election. We still hear them today. Uh, and there's one that I'd like to bring up. Uh, the slogan, uh, if debt is not the problem, if debt is the problem, more debt is not the answer. So, Deputy Speaker, if more debt was not the answer, why did the government do a deal with the Greens to legislate for unlimited debt? What about the issue of this budget emergency? We heard, saw and read an awful lot about that from the coalition prior to the election. But when we actually saw the Abbott government's MIEFO last year, the first budget document to be published under the new government, we saw a, seven, a nearly $17 billion budget blowout for 2013-14, more than a 50 per cent increase in the budget deficit, 60 per cent of which was due to decisions of this government. And that blowout from a deficit of $30 billion to $47 billion uh, represented a huge amount every day, $160 million uh, per day. And, uh, Deputy, Deputy Speaker, uh, the component of the budget deficit that didn't represent increased expenditure uh, was as a result largely uh, of changes uh, in assumptions. Uh, we learned uh, last night uh, when the Secretary of the Department of Finance, David Chun, uh, so yesterday morning, sorry, when the Secretary of the Department of Finance, David Chun, spoke to Senate estimates uh, that the estimates in MIEFO uh, had dropped the former Labor government's fiscal rules, which limited real spending growth. Uh, and Mr Chun confirmed to Senate estimates that this change in assumptions increased MIEFO's projections of the size of budget debt over the decade to 2023-24. So, what my EFO did was to deceitfully change the rules and then claim, lo and behold, to uncover a $667 billion debt figure. Uh, and uh, if the, the, uh, these politically biased assumptions uh, had the effect of pumping up the debt and deficit projections, pumping them up markedly, Deputy Speaker, uh, the uh, independent pre-election economic and fiscal outlook clearly shows that on the former government's policy settings, the medium-term projection had the underlying cash surplus growing after the forward estimates and reaching 1 per cent of GDP in 
2021. Uh, net debt was projected to return to zero in 2023-24. Uh, that figure of a surplus of 1 per cent of GDP in 2020 to 2021 is an important figure, Deputy Speaker, uh, because we know that the terms of the National Commission of, uh, Commission of Audit uh, were a requirement uh, that the Commission, quote, make recommendations to achieve savings sufficient to deliver a surplus of 1 per cent of GDP prior to 2023-24. But, Deputy Speaker, if you don't make the $9 billion grant to the Reserve Bank, if you don't give $700 million to multinational firms through tax loopholes, and if you don't relax the fiscal rules, you've got that surplus of 1 per cent of GDP uh, happening in 2020-2021. That surplus is there in the pre-election economic and fiscal outlook. Now, there's, uh, there's been a lot, uh, a lot of games uh, played with the pre-election economic and, uh, and fiscal, fiscal outlook. Uh, these are games, ironically, which were played uh, by a party uh, that put PFO into place. After the 1996 election, then Treasurer Costello uh, put in place uh, a charter of budget honesty. That charter required the Secretaries of Treasury and Finance to prepare a pre-election fiscal and economic outlook, PFO, uh, that ensured, as Treasurer Costello put it at the time, quote, that the Australian people know the situation before an election begins and so that elections can be conducted on the basis of facts and not on the basis of deceit, as governments in the past have sought to do. Uh, PFO was to spiders in the, was the fiscal equivalent of Mortine for spiders in the closet. It made it impossible for a new government to claim that, uh, lo and behold, the state of the books were not what had been represented. Because what PFO does is it ensures that the independent secretaries of Tre Treasury and Finance sit down during the election campaign and set out the state of the books. Now, the spider-free economy that the government took on uh, had uh, an economy with solid growth, unemployment low by historical standards, Gross debt projected to peak at $370 billion in 2016-17. That, Deputy Speaker, is, is the spider-free economy uh, that uh, the Treasurer took on. Uh, and that was underpinned by strong economic growth during Labor's time in office. Uh, when Labor took office, our economy was the 15th largest in the world. When Labor left office, our economy was the 12th largest in the world. In terms of income per person, we did better yet. We rose from 17th in the world when Labor took office to 8th in the world when Labor left office. In terms of infrastructure spending, we did better still. As the member for Graindler has uh, articulately pointed out on numerous occasions, when we took office, we were ranked worse than 20th in the, in the OECD in terms of our infrastructure investment. In 2012 and 2013, we were ranked first by the OECD for our infrastructure investment. We also continued to benefit Australians in other ways. Lower interest rates for someone with a $300,000 mortgage uh, meant a saving of over $100 a week. And we made a series of tough decisions in our budgets. In fact, uh, I'll warrant, Deputy Speaker, uh, that Labor's final budget uh, will uh, not only take the record for being the only budget uh, in Australian history to have achieved a reduction in nominal spending, uh, but will also keep that record. I find it very hard, Deputy Speaker, to imagine uh, that, uh, that, that another government will succeed in doing that. And that was done in, in ways that ensured uh, that uh, if uh, uh, spending had to be addressed, that it was done in the fairest possible way, in a way that didn't hit jobs. So, Deputy Speaker, when we cracked down on multinational profit shifting, we saved taxpayers billions of dollars. And when we uh, means tested the private health insurance rebate, we did so in a way that ensured that uh, it was restricted from, tho from those uh, who had the greatest means uh, in the community. Uh, those opposite uh, foresaw, foresaw doom. Uh, they said that private health insurance take-up 
uh, would plummet as a result of the means testing. Uh, but the data has given the lie to that claim. Uh, when we means tested uh, and, and then restri uh, restricted the uh, baby bonus to second and subsequent children, uh, the now treasurer said it was like chi China's one child policy. Like China's one child policy, Deputy Speaker. So he goes and he gives these speeches about the age of entitlement. But when Labor came in government to put in place modest savings measures, to ensure that savings were made in a way that shared the burden fairly across the community, all the member for North Sydney could do was to run scare campaigns. Big speaking speeches in London, scare campaigns in Australia. And when you look at the decisions that the government is making, they're decisions that are going to uh, assist uh, the most affluent and imperil jobs. This is the first Treasurer to knock back a foreign investment bid by a US company, potentially imperiling jobs in Australia. The Treasurer's decision to give $9 billion to the Reserve Bank is bewildering, given that we have no evidence that the Reserve Bank asked for such a grant and that the Treasurer is defying a Senate order to produce the documentation that would support that. The Treasurer says, Deputy Speaker, that the reason that he needed to give $9 billion to the Reserve Bank uh, was that Labor had taken a, a larger dividend from the Reserve Bank than was appropriate. But again, the data give the lie to that, that claim. Adjusting for inflation, the Howard government took $3 billion a year from the Reserve, ba Reserve Bank. Labor won the half billion dollars a year. So Labor, what, what Labor took from the Reserve Bank was half in real terms what the coalition in, their, in office took, for, took from the uh, Reserve Bank. And of course, we know why the Treasurer has gifted $9 billion to the Reserve Bank. It's because he wants the 2013 budget to be someone else's problem. He's like a coach who takes over the job a quarter of the way into the season and wants to be able to blame a whole set of decisions on his predecessor. But, Deputy Speaker, this is, this is a man who hasn't made the transition into, uh, into government. Uh, like the Prime Minister, the Treasurer uh, is, a, uh, is a shadow treasurer in drag. Uh, he's a man who is still out there uh, attacking the economy when he should be fighting for jobs. Uh, he's happy to come in here and play a game of high-stakes poker with Holden. But when he loses, he wants to blame that on someone else. And at the same time, he is making decisions uh, which will cost the budget still further. Uh, a parental leave scheme, which his own backbench uh, strongly opposes. Uh, Alex Hawke, the member for... Uh, now, where is Alex member for? Mitchell. Mitchell. The member for Mitchell is, I think... Uh, uh, the, uh, the strongest uh, uh, the, or the most articulate uh, critic of uh, the parental leave scheme uh, on the other side, uh, arguing not unreasonably that a scheme that gives $75,000 uh, to a millionaire family to have a baby is probably a scheme that's pretty hard to justify to the average family when they're having their school kids bonus taken away. What were the talking points when uh, the, uh, the coalition were putting in place this uh, uh, gold-plated, diamond-encrusted parental leave scheme? Well, they came out and told us uh, it was appropriate to have such a generous scheme because it was an entitlement. That's why we had to support it, because uh, wage replacement, parental leave paid for by the taxpayer was an entitlement. Not much for the end of the age of entitlement, Deputy Speaker. I think the age of entitlement is just getting going for those millionaire families. And, of, of course, it's just getting going if you're a mining billionaire too, uh, because you're going to see a very generous uh, tax cut under this government, uh, something in the order of $4, uh, $4 billion under the forward estimates uh, being forecast uh, by this Treasurer uh, to be lost uh, when the mining tax is repealed. So, for the no surprises, no excuses government uh, that the Australian people were promised, uh, they're seeing something entirely different. A uh, Prime Minister who said that there would be no cuts to education, no cuts to health, no change to pension, no change to the GST and no cuts uh, 
to the ABC or the SBS, uh, is now facing off with a Treasurer who says that all options are on the table. Uh, last Friday we heard reports, Deputy Speaker, that the Treasurer was flagging changes to Medicare education and the pension age. Uh, so, uh, despite the fact that he spent an election campaign clutching a real solutions pamphlet, Deputy Speaker, which says on page 49 that the government will be more accountable to the Australian public, uh, we now have a commission of audit uh, which has been uh, sitting on the Treasurer's desk since Valentine's Day. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, if this had been a, uh, a bunch of roses, it would be uh, a little worse for wear by now. I have to say the, uh, the roses that I purchased my wife on Valentine's Day uh, uh, had to be consigned to the dustbin by then. Uh, but the, uh, the Treasurer uh, has uh, apparently been more interested in other reading. Uh, we have uh, seen in recent media reports that he is halfway through uh, a new biography of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, now, uh, perhaps he could, uh, while he is reading Margaret Thatcher's biography, share with the Australian people the Commission of Audit report. Of course, that was what the Howard government did when they, co uh, they commissioned a Commission of Audit report. Uh, they co they uh, had a Commission of Audit that was independent and which released its report to the Australian public at the same time as it did so to the Treasurer. But this is, a, uh, this is a, a government which is even more secretive than the Howard government, uh, which, let's face it, Deputy Speaker, didn't win many international records uh, for its commitment to transparency and, uh, and openness. Uh, the Treasurer said that he would release the Commission of Audit report sooner rather than later. Uh, well, Treasurer, the time is ticking. This is, of course, the Treasurer who said he'd give us a bu budget update in his first 100 days in office and failed to meet that deadline. Uh, so he clearly, clearly has, uh, has formed. That's right, my EFA not delivered in the first 100, 100 days. Deputy Speaker, we, uh, we hear a lot uh, about, uh, from, the, from those, uh, those opposite uh, about the state that Labor left the budget in. But the state that they claim uh, was the state that they, they received isn't what Peter Costello would have said. Peter Costello would have said, if you want to know the state of the, the, state of the books when you took over, look at PFO. Uh, Joe Hockey and Matthias Cormann want you to look to my EFO, uh, a document delivered uh, more than three months into the, uh, into the Abbott government. When uh, Labor left office, as independently verified by uh, pre-election economic and fiscal outlook, there was a surplus in 2016-17. Uh, Labor had Deficits across the forward estimates of $54.6 billion, but by the time we got to my EFO, those cumulative deficits over the forwards had more than doubled to $123 billion. We saw from the PFO to my EFO Labor having net debt at zero by 2023-24, but once the Abbott government had put in place their changes in expenditure, which we're debating today, and their shonky changes to the fiscal rules, net debt by 2023-24 was projected to be 14.3 per cent of GDP. So the fact is, Deputy Speaker, Labor had the budget heading into surplus in 2016-17 and zero net debt in a decade. This government, by decisions totally of its own accord, had blown that out of the, out of the water. Deputy Speaker, this debate is, is occurring uh, in a broader context, and, and it's absolutely critical uh, to recognise that, that context, which is that uh, the government is trying to pretend that Australia is a different country from that which it is. Uh, the uh, uh, Social Services Minister, Kevin Andrews, has been found by the ABC Fact Check Unit uh, to be false uh, in his claims uh, that uh, Australia's welfare system is not sustainable. To have suggested that there's a European-style fiscal crunch coming within a decade. Uh, the, uh, the, the simple fact is, uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, that when we look at how Australia compares with other countries and when we look at the size of government uh, in Australia, uh, Australia is a relatively low-taxing country. Don't take my word for that, Deputy Speaker. In 2006, uh, then Treasurer Peter Costello, I can't quite believe I'm quoting him twice in this speech, but there you go. Even a stop clock is right twice a day. Um, 
requested a, a rundown on how our tax system compared with other countries. And uh, the report, which is uh, co-authored by uh, Peter Hendy, now the uh, member for Eden Monero, concluded simply, quote, Australia is a low tax country. That report pointed out we don't have wealth, estate, inheritance or gift taxes. And it found, out that for in, found that for individuals, we have one of the lowest income tax burdens in the developed world. And since then, Deputy Speaker, Federal Labor has delivered significant personal income tax cuts. When Peter Costello was describing Australia as a low tax country, the federal tax to GDP ratio was 24 per cent. After six years of Labor, that ratio had fallen to 23 per cent. Add in state and local governments, and the tax ratio is around 33 per cent of national income. Put that in perspective, New Zealand and the United Kingdom currently have a tax take that exceeds 40 per cent of GDP, and they've got Conservative governments in charge. So, Deputy Speaker, let's see this for what it is. The size of our government is much more similar to Korea or the United States, not as ideologues on the right would have you believe, in the League of Finland and Switzerland. And so when this government uh, attacks expenditure, uh, when it says that it is unsustainable to have a school kids bonus, to have income support payments, to ensure that low income earners get a fair deal on their superannuation and don't pay a higher tax rate on super than they pay on wages, then you're listening to an ideological agenda. When the chairman of the Prime Minister's Business Advisory Council, Maurice Newman, describes disability care as reckless, Deputy Speaker, he's striking fear into the hearts of thousands of Australians with a, dis with a disability. Now, this government has engaged in backfl backflips on school, uh, school funding uh, and backflips on debt. I mean, this is, after all, a government that went from holding press conferences in front of a debt truck uh, to striking a deal with the Greens for uncapped debt. It's hard to tell, Deputy Speaker, whether B.A. Santa Maria, Friedrich Hayek or the Marx Brothers are in charge. And you don't need to take it from me, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Peter Costello famously said that he would endorse uh, three times the, co the, uh, the, the, uh, the cock has crowed, isn't it? Famously replied uh, when asked if he'd endorse Tony Abbott, oh, not on economic matters. And he said in private to describe the Prime Minister as economically illiterate. His former employer, uh, John Hewson, has uh, covered off the other side of the basic skills test by describing the Prime Minister as innumerate. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a government, Deputy Speaker, uh, which needs to recognise the broad context in which it sits, which needs to recognise a report uh, from the mid-2000s which describes Australia as a low-tax, low tax, low-spending low nation. Deputy Speaker, the vital debate in Australia at the moment is over productivity and it's over jobs. And if you're serious about, it, about jobs, Deputy Speaker, you have to get the short-term settings right and the long-term settings right. In the short term, it's absolutely vital that we don't withdraw demand from the economy at a time when employment is fragile. This is a uh, government that came to office with a target to generate uh, a million jobs uh, by in five years. But yet since winning office, we've seen very modest growth in uh, part-time jobs, but backsliding in full-time jobs. 63,000 full-time jobs lost uh, since this government came to, came to office. So the net result is 7,000 uh, net jobs gone. Uh, that million jobs target is slipping away by the day. Partly that's because, Deputy Speaker, and I'm sure the Shadow Minister and the, uh, the, the table may have something to say about this, uh, this is a government which said no to foreign investment in Grain Corps, uh, which said no to foreign investment that would have genera generated uh, jobs in the rural sure, sector. The parliamentary and, and Labor take a, a later if he likes. Did I just promote the Parliamentary Secretary? Uh, excuse, uh, please uh, please uh, accept my withdrawal, Deputy Lee Speaker. Uh, <laughs> he can make a uh, personal explanation later if he needs to. Uh, and uh, this is, a, uh, this is, this is a, a government which is withdrawing regional jobs as it closes ATO offices. Now, a government which is serious about its jobs isn't a government that ought to be firing public servants left, right and centre. 
particularly not as the growth in public sector employment under Labor was slower than the growth in population. That's it. The growth in public servants was smaller than the growth in population. And most public service services are uh, deployed on, on the basis that you need a certain number of people to look after the population, uh, whether that's in the, the hard-working public servants and the Centrelink offices, and the family, ass family assistance offices and the Medicare offices. So anyone that argues that Australia has a bloated uh, public, uh, public employment problem uh, ought to say that doubly uh, of the Howard government, which had more public servants per capita uh, than we have today. So, in the short term, the government is withdrawing demand and it is cutting jobs at a fragile time for the economy. But it's the long term that worries me even more, Dep uh, Deputy Speaker. Because in the long term, if you want to sustain employment, you need to make the investments uh, in skills and in infrastructure. You need to make the investments in the national broadband network and in ur urban rail, both of which this government is walking away from. Having breached their promise, their solemn pledge to the Australian people to, to deliver 25 megabits a second to, to Australians by 2016. They've now said that, disappointingly, that's impossible to, uh, to deliver on. Having said that he wants to be the infrastructure Prime Minister, the Prime Minister has now backed away from Infrastructure Australia, a process designed to put infrastructure decisions at arm's length, and is being criticised by members of the business community for being unwilling to fund urban public transport, fundamentally, fundamental to city productivity. And then there's what they're doing on, on education, Deputy Speaker. You need investment in great schools if you're to build the jobs of the future. But this is where, where Labor said, we're going to strike a deal with states where we put in $2 of federal funds and the states guarantee a dollar for federal funds. This government's funding deal is we'll put in $2 of federal funds and if you want to take out your funds at the same time, feel free. That's a very different deal to the unity ticket that Australians were promised on school funding. And it is fundamental to Australia's economic prosperity. Because we cannot be a high-skill, productive nation in the future if we're slashing into schools, if we're getting rid of trades training centres, and if, as, as this education minister has suggest, suggested, we walk away from the demand-driven model which has allowed children first in their family to attend university and which has benefited particularly uh, rural and regional students. These hits to Australia's productivity and to the short-term growth pro prospects uh, are deeply disturbing, uh, Deputy, Deputy Speaker. Uh, we need uh, the government that we were promised before the election, a government of no surprises and no excuses, that takes responsibility, steps up to the plate uh, as an adult government and is willing to make the decisions that Austra the Australian economy demands.